Lord. Hi everyone and welcome to the Jeff Willis Show. Today I have Rick Cromie, in fact Dr. Rick Cromie, I'm not sure whether he likes doctor in his name but um, <laughs> formally it's Dr. Rick Cromie. Uh, welcome to the show Rick, it's great to have you here. Good to be here, thank you for having me Jeff. So I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Rick Cromie, um, get a little bit of a blurb about him. So he's a cultural explorer, social historian, generational futurist and an international keynote speaker. A best-selling author, he has penned over a dozen books on leadership, national motivation, creative communication and classroom management. His most recent work, Gen Tech, an American story of technology change and who we really are. Uh, tell me when you've discovered that, uh, Rick, because that would be really good. Tell me who <laughs> I am or you are, that would be great. Um, is now available online and in bookstores everywhere. His book is a humorous romp like the word romp, Rick, that's a really good word, exploring why labelling people by who they are born like baby boomers and millennials just doesn't work. Instead, yeah. Dr. Chrome explores the tech we use during our coming of age years between 10 and 25 years old. Uh, I think it can last longer than that, Rick, actually. Um, it can be after 50, really. Um, <laughs> yeah, it took me to 50 to find out who I was. Um, anyway, learning where people fit and the wealth where they bring through tech Technology use will change lives, whether in the boardroom or the classroom. Learn more about Rick at rickcromie.com. Now, a little bit more about Rick. Um, this is, you know, it's not really a secret, but he served as a pastor, professor, and speaker trainer, and worked in the non-profit and corporate sectors. In 2017, he started the business MANA Educational Services to inspire and equip leaders, teachers, pastors, and parents. Rick holds a doctorate in leadership and emerging culture and travels the US and the world to speak on culture, faith, history, education, and leadership topics. Welcome to the show, Rick. It's great well, to have you Well, thank you, here. Jeff. Yeah, again, Ben, by the way, you read that just like my publicist wrote it, so thank you very much. <laughs> well done. <laughs> well, I just had to be uh, true to purpose to make sure Lynette didn't uh, smack me really later because, uh, you know. I like the word romp too. That's, yeah, that's yeah, so. Um, <laughs> Look, uh, we're doing social distancing here, which is really cool. Um, not really. Uh, it's not really cool at all. In fact, I hate social distancing because uh, it stops us being human because nothing like a good hug. Uh, but hugs have become illegal, which is really quite disturbing, really. Um, so uh, of handshakes. <laughs> well, the other one that is sort of being done now is the, the, knee, the elbow tap. Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, which sort of feels rather weird, really. I think I'm, you know, people go to do it. I think I'll just, uh, I don't know what I mean to do, but the elbow tap's sort of really weird. But anyway, it's sort of emerged as the new handshake in this uh, COVID world. So, uh, yeah. So, Rick, uh, I'm interested by cultural explorer yeah. and generational futurists. So, uh, how did that all start? That this obviously there's you've got uh, some curiosity around that topic. So cultural explorer, generational futurist. Tell me a bit about uh, how this all uh, turned into a book. Well, this is uh, one of those uh, books, Jeff, that has been probably thirty years in the making. I I started off, you know, back back in my church days when I was a pastor, I worked with youth groups, and so I was doing a lot of work with the kids and helping helping parents and other leaders understand the uh, kids these days, you know, typical stuff. And in the process became fascinated with the, the generational tags that were starting to be stuck to different generations. Uh, one of the first was uh, there was a book in 1980 by Landry Jones. Uh, I think he's a former editor at uh, People magazine, but he wrote this book called Great Expectations. And he's the one that named the baby boom generation here in America. And I found that fascinating because not soon after that, everybody started to name things, you know, name these generations. Uh, the, my generation and your generation, we were called the baby busters in, in America. And then, um, you know, eventually in 1991, Gen X, there was a book by Douglas Copeland talking about Gen X and he named it, it was a fictional novel about Gen X. And somehow that name got reapplied over the, the uh, baby buster idea. And about the same time, you had these millennials starting to, to bubble, and they were initially called Gen Y, but um, there was a book by uh, Strauss and Howe called Generations that came out in 1991, 
this book, which was, uh, like it says, the history of America's future, they go all the way back to 1584. And they basically lined out the generations in America. And they did a very good job of it. I, I, I tend to like this particular book because I think it's, it's has some good historical accuracy, plus sociologically is astute. And I think uh, in many ways, just um, uh, insightful in how it, it lined out those generations. And it, one of the best things it did was I was born in 1963 and good old Landry Jones had me labeled as a baby boomer because it, he ended the generation for boomers in 64. And I never felt like a baby boomer. Strauss and Howe come along and they say, no, you're part of what we call the 13th generation. Later, they, they, they conceded Gen X. But between 1961 and 1981, my generation was known as the Gen X generation. And the bottom line is, I, I just started exploring all the different ways that we tended to look at generations and understand them. And about the same time, around the year 2000 is when I started to notice it, uh, was, was technology. A lot of my workshops, a lot of my writing, I tended to go back to how technology was influencing us. And long story short, um, you know, by the end of the 2000s, I saw how these these emerging generations were influenced by the i technologies, the iPhone, the iPad, the iPod, iTunes, iWatch, all those. And so I kind of self-named that generation, the iTech generation, and people were, were picking up on it uh, quite a bit. Uh, of course, uh, some other marketers got into the business of naming uh, generations back in 19, well, the late 90s. I think 1995 was, was kind of when Gen Z which is a very lazy label, if you ask me. I, I think it, it says nothing and really um, helps us with very little. And plus, if you start looking at Gen Z uh, and looking at who, how they're framed, it's all over the map, Jeff. It's you know sometimes 97 to 2000, sometimes 95 to 2005. Strauss and Howe and their follow-up books, they, they list the millennials as ending in 2006. So that makes the next generation, you know, 2007. So it was all over the map. And I did my doctorate, as, as you noted, in um, cultural exploration. I was actually trained in what was called the science of a semiotics where we, we understood signs. I like to say I'm kind of like a weather forecaster. I look back at the history of culture and then we look for patterns. And I was just trained, highly trained in how to look at these patterns. And in the process, once you know the patterns, you can then start to project. You can start to look into the future. And that's when I started making some elementary forecasts. You know, I, I predicted several years ago about the demise of the compact disc and the DVD. I saw streaming coming way before anybody else saw it. I saw online learning coming long before other people saw it. And, and so those, those things start to, start to be part of, of my, my futurist side. And that's kind of where it happened. And the book itself came about because uh, I, I was just trying to figure out a way to, to, to look differently at generations. And it's kind of like two great things that go great together, chocolate and peanut butter. It just mashed one day. And I realized, wow, technology probably frames us more than anything else. And I use these coming of age years, Jeff, because I've long proposed that the music of our life, whatever the soundtrack of your life is, probably formed between the ages of 10 and 25. Mm -hmm. For me, that would be the music of 1973 to 1988. I, I just, if you look at my iPod, if you look at my music collection, the majority of the music comes between 1973 and 1988 for me. That's my comfort music. And it got me thinking that technology is the same way. We all come of age. And the thing is, is that there's tipping points also with technology. You know, television, it, its tipping point wasn't until about 1950, 1960. It started to have a tipping point in culture where more people had it than didn't. And there's a generation that was coming of age just as a technology was tipping. And that's where this generational personality comes from. And it has huge implications in business how we interact in business has huge implications for how we communicate in the classroom, how we communicate even like this. Uh, it has uh, great implications for, in my, in my world, I also do a lot with the church world, about how we congregate and how we disciple and, and, and teach. So there's, there's a lot, of, lot to it. And I've probably unpacked more than you want at this point, but uh, no. that's just in general, yeah. Now we've got a lot more to unpack yet. That's, uh, that's very cool. I recently read a book 
called Out of Control by um, Kelly. I don't know if you've read that. Um, it's very much about how man and machines are mm. evolving together. Uh, it goes back into the history of the planet, right back. He talks about uh, a whole range of topics. And I certainly, for me, just observing, um, you know, like I'm born a little bit before you. I'm, I suppose I fit into the baby boomer box, really, because I was born in 1957. Yeah, so, that was a good year for Chevys, too. Yeah, I know. I want to get one of those because I, I'm thinking of getting a car the same age as me, which means it's quite old. Um, but, but cool, right? They, they, they made some really cool cars back there with big fins. and uh, yeah. Also, yeah, so, uh, you're, you're not old, Jeff. You're vintage. Oh, that's true. I, that's, I, I go to uh, vintage shops as well and um, uh, even listen to vinyl. But, uh, yeah, so... I'm a, yeah. <laughs> that's right. So... I, I totally agree with you. Technology does change who we are. Uh, I uh, was inspired back 12 years ago to actually start a business because of changing technology. I'd been, you know, I'd started several businesses over the years and a lot of them are actually all around tech. So tech has a huge impact on who we are as human beings and our interface to it. So let's go back to, uh, you talk about three generations. Mm -hmm. Right. So firstly, one you talk about is audio. So let's dive into that a little. Let's unpack audio a little bit in terms of its impact. And, uh, uh, and then we'll talk about some of the others. But the audio generation. Right. Actually, th those are those are uh, there, there are four generations within the audio generations. And then there's going to be uh, four generations within the, uh, the visual generation. And then there's going to be four generations within the, uh, um, the, the digital generation, uh, digital. Yep. So these are, these are, I don't know if we call them stages or. Um, um, stages of work. <laughs> yeah. But um, the, the, I start the book in 1900. And the reason for that is I've long proposed that there has been more change in the history of the world, well, there's been more change in the last, since 1900, in the last 120 years, than there has been the entire history of the world. When you start thinking about what man has been capable of doing, I mean, we, 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 we got automobiles and, and airplanes, uh, eventually, you know, when we think about the communication text of the telephone, vinyl record, motion pictures, uh, and then you got television and all those, and, and those, those emerging, you know, they, they, there's just so much change has happened since uh, since 1900. The first, that's it's not stage, it's phase. I call them phases. The first phase is the audio phase, and these are the generations born between 1900 and and 1940. That area, uh, these are the early audio. They they were very um, uh, oral in their um, in their. Um, technology, uh, the telephone, I call the first generation, the telephone transportation generation, or the TNT generation, 1900 to 1920. Uh, they grew up on that, that, that tipping point of telephones, and, you know, cars, and in the sky, you had the airplanes and such. And so that became a huge part. They were the wheel generation. And it is very interesting that by the time they came of age, they were the ones that went off to war. They went off to World War I first. The earlier ones did. The later ones went off to World War II. When they got back from war, the first thing they bought was a car. That was their status symbol. That was, a, you know, a car and a house, especially post-World War II. You know, suburbia was built upon the, 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 these generations coming back and, and buying cars. And so that, that allowed them to have more transportation, allowed them to take uh, trips and go places. The entire, in America, we're built upon an RV industry, recreational vehicle industry. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that was built uh, post-World War II by this generation of the, the wheel generation. The, um, between 1910 and 1930 uh, is an interesting generation I call the motion picture generation. They, they came of age to, first of all, silent movies. Uh, and then they moved into the talkies. And eventually, when you look at their coming of age years and realize a generation, again, between the ages of 10 and 25, you can then, in the book, I show how it plays out. For the motion picture generation, that would be between the age, between 1920 would be their coming of age years and 1955. And when you look at it from that perspective, that's called the golden age of the motion picture story in America. It's amazing how that plays out. They are right there. 
And I was surprised how well it worked. Uh, when I start, you start off with a theory, Jeff, especially sociological theories, and, and you just play with them and see. But this one really started to, to speak. And it, it started to create a narrative. That's why I call it a story of America and tech, our technology. And what I'm curious about, you know, not to get off topic here, but since we're on topic, off topic, I, I'm curious here eventually to find out, you know, you, I think you've read the book uh, or looked I at have. the book enough that did it play out kind of the same way in New Zealand? See, for us, it's an American story. That's why I wrote from that perspective. But my suspicion is, is that in civilized cultures, you know, Europe and Australia and places like that, that you're still going to see a very similar type of timeline with the technology. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, we've, you know, that's, I suppose, called developed countries. Um, they're part of the OECD group of countries as well. Right. So, yeah, very much the same here. Uh, I think... Uh, I remember getting frustrated not being able to watch the latest movie because it was appearing in America and you heard it in the news and it didn't, didn't turn up on a boat or a plane uh, for several months later. Um, <laughs> so whereas now we can have almost instant access globally to any information, which, right. uh, which is rather exciting. Uh, so uh, it's certainly accelerating change, that is for sure. Right. So, you've got, so you've got the audio... Uh, yeah, and, and there's the other two generations in the audio generation is the radio generation and the vinyl record generation. Uh, those are all the, that's that audio phase of the text. And then you move into the visual. Yeah. yeah. So let's, uh, let's dive into visual. Okay. Let's, let's have a, so, let's, so visual obviously was driven a lot by the almighty television, which we've been addicted to for over half a century now. Right. Um, so let's, let's dive into the television phase. Right. Well, there are certain technologies that are what I call mega technologies. In fact, back in my doctoral work, this was part of one of the, the little uh, uh, theories that I also developed. It's what I call cultural language theory. There are certain technologies that can change an entire culture, how we speak, how we communicate, how we you know, teach, learn, work, all those things. And when I started looking at these this cultural languages, I realized that it was technology then that, that was, again, guiding it. And we haven't had a, a huge cultural shift for about 500 years. Uh, the last cultural shift that we had, the, 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 there were three mega technologies that emerged, and that was the, the, um, the, the mechanical clock, the printing press, and yeah. what I call the scopes, the microscope and the telescope. Those three technologies exploded us out of the dark ages into what we call now commonly modernity, um, whether it was Renaissance and Reformation, Enlightenment or Industrial Ages, the Scientific Age, all that happened in the last 500 years. Well, television was the first technology that started to move us away from that old frame. It started to explode. It was a new megatech. Uh, the other two megatechs, by the way, are the cell phone or mobile phone and the, um, the internet, yeah. those technologies also moved us. And what they mm -hmm. did that was different was they flattened culture. They flattened our, our, our communication so that you could, a cell phone, you could, you could communicate anywhere, anytime, any play. I, it was just, it, it flattened it. Same thing with the internet. It flattened information. It, flat, it allowed someone like me to become, you know, a great, you could make a lot of money on YouTube, you know, just an ordinary guy ordinary guy like you podcasting and become, you know, rich and famous from it. it it's amazing. You couldn't do that, you know, a hundred years ago. You had to have some money. You had to have some money in the family. You had to have maybe royal name, royal blood flowing through you. Yep. Uh, you were pretty limited and you were also pretty local. Now we can be global. We can be global and local at the same time. And so back to the, the visual phase, television was one that kind of guided several of these generations. And the television generation, 1940 to 1960, was followed by the space generation. When you think about space, a lot of times we don't think of it as a visual generation, but really it's what, it's what launched the other ones. Because what space did was it put up satellites, satellites that changed how we we're able to see our whole world. So it's very much a visual generation. Followed by, and space generation was from 1960 to 19, or 1950 to 1960 or 70. And then the um, cable television or the gamer generation from 1960 to 1980 and cable television generation from 1970 to 1990. And if you think cable television for a moment, 
you know, it's interesting that 1980 in America anyway was the explosion of cable television. When I wrote, wrote that chapter, I was, I was kind of playing with it. You know, 1970, you know, starting that generation, really through the 70s, you didn't have much cable television unless you were in a rural location. But in 1980, that all changed. CNN, 81 was MTV. Uh, you had ESPN as well emerged. All those major core types of channels. And which hopefully you get down there in, in Australia as well, you know, those, those major, but yeah, that created yeah. that visual phase of yeah, those generations. Yeah, it's, certainly TV for me was pretty exciting. Um, uh, we had a, uh, mum and dad were a little bit reticent about allowing a TV into the house. I, I used ah. to, um, so we rented a TV uh, during our school holidays. That was, that was the big exciting time. Like we couldn't wait for school to end. So we have school holidays so we could watch TV. Yeah. And so the, and I remember uh, that uh, my friend had a TV. It was black and white. Uh, and I was so obsessed with it that um, I'd drop in on my way home from school. And even if my friend wasn't there, because he was hanging out with other friends, I sort of knock on the door and I go, Mrs. Vedonk, and that was her last name. She was Dutch. She said, Mrs. Vedonk, um, could I watch TV? look, I, I really want to see the cartoons. Um, so I would have been all of, you know, six or seven. And, uh, and I just, I was fascinated by it. Um, yeah, that for me was the first addictive technology. Um, and, you know, radio was sort of addictive, listening to, you know, uh, ACDC and uh, the Beatles on the radio. Uh, and so... The TV for me was really the addictive. I re but I do remember listening to the radio at five o'clock, listening to what we had in Australia called the Argonauts, which is like a narrative. Yeah, uh, yeah. So radio very much was about uh, the narrative, not just uh, uh, music. So I remember that uh, there was a great narrative told on the radio, which got everyone really, really s scared, um, called War of the Worlds, I think. Is that correct? That's right. Is that, is that the one that created right. panic in the streets? So, That's right. What's your I think take? It was 19, I think it was yeah. 1947. Orson Welles did The War of the Worlds, and it was so real that he came out the next day. You can look at it. You can find it on YouTube. He actually came out the very next day and apologized, saying, hey, I didn't mean to cause all this, this much trouble here. Uh, <laughs> it was just a story, but it was so real. Uh, and yeah. in many ways, it's kind of interesting that it, it was, if, and I think part of the I'm going back to my history here, so forgive me, you're, you're, you're testing my history. But I think the Hindenburg was like only a, a, a couple of years earlier than that. And that was the first, the Hindenburg going down and exploding, that was also broadcast on live radio. And it was kind of the, we talk about reality television. Well, we had reality radio as well at the time. Yeah. And that's part of the reason why War of the Worlds caused such a panic was because of, you know, the, it was echoing the Hindenburg and that type of a tragic thing, and, except it was more all over the world. Yeah. You know, it was, it was this craziness. Yeah. I, I, I remember reading that story um, and the fact that it created panic in the streets because people thought uh, we were being invaded by the Martians. Uh, or someone. Uh, so I remember certainly radio from a narrative point of view. And today, what's interesting watching, and we'll do it a little bit later, but the podcasting industry, which is starting to really get some traction with half a billion dollars by Spotify being spent in the last 12 months, mm -hmm. uh, narrative podcasting is certainly starting to come into its own that sits next to the visual, such as you know, uh, TV series, uh, online, and also movies. So so, okay, so we've got the TV generation, which is a megatech. I totally agree with you. I, for me, I can still remember sitting in front of the TV and watching man landing on the moon. And it was terribly grainy. Um, you had to use your imagination because it was so poor definition, uh, which I think led a lot of people to say that it was actually a hoax. So that the old hoax uh, thing has certainly been running around for the last... 30, 40 years. So well, the, um, the, the, the funny thing, Jeff, about the moon landing, <laughs> what we remember is more probably um, Armstrong, you know, jump, you know, stepping off of the, off of the, uh, the, the, yep. the capsule there onto the moon surface. 
I did not realize until I was doing research on the chapter, the space chapter, and in particular the moon landing, that CBS News, when they, and, and the other stations, CBS was pretty much leading it, but CBS did not, they, they had a, 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 a simulated visual, let's just put it that way, of, a, of the capsule landing. They did not have a camera to show the capsule actually landing on the moon. We, we really don't have video of the capsule landing on the moon. What we have is a simulation that a news organization put out. So I found that fascinating, you know. <laughs> Even back then, they were simulating certain things to make it look like it was really that capsule. But what we do remember, you're right, is that man stepping on the moon. You know, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind and America this is what I'm proud of America is the only country in the world to ever step on the moon Russia landed on the moon uh, I think 1974 1975 they had a probe that landed on the moon but right. they never put a man actually on the moon oh, that's an American story it's unique to a unique American story and something we can be proud of yeah well it's uh, you're certainly telling an American story in your book and uh, so and America has been very much at the core of the technology race along with, well, it's been certainly a technology race for a long time. So the visual, let's sort of uh, just get back to the different generations. So you've got, what are the different visual uh, generations again? So you've got right. mega Again, it starts with that telev the television generation from 40 to 60, 1940 to 1960. Or yeah, 1940, 1960. Then you have the, and if you notice, these generations also overlap, Jeff. Oh yeah. They, they, yeah. they, and that makes you part of two generations, which I think is a little bit more dynamic way of looking at us rather than kind of stacked up uh, as generations. But from 1950 to 1970, that's the space generation. From 1960 to 1980, that's the gamer generation, video games. Yeah. Uh, this is, you know, Pac-Man and Mario Brothers and Pong and all that and, and asteroids. And then uh, from 19, um, 1970 to 1990, that is the cable television generation. Those are the four generations that make up the visual uh, phase of Gentech. Yeah. Yeah, it's certainly the space uh, industry one really fascinated me and uh, – but the next phase, which we uh, will dive into now, is the digital. Now, digital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So digital is, uh, and again, you're right. These are stacking on top. This is aggregation of technology that. Yeah. yeah okay. So we've got, of course, we've got the telephones still. We've still got radio. Uh, we've got TV, uh, but we're stacking technology on top of technology. And it's, it's almost becomes hyperactive in the sense of they feed off each other. So now we're into the, well, the key. The key yeah. again is those coming of age years. Yeah. You know, when you're coming of age, you come of age between ages 10 and 25. That's a developmental thing, by the way. I, I know you earlier you're saying, well, I'm not sure I've actually fully come of age. You know, most sociologists, most biologists, most doctors would tell you, you've, you've usually by age 25, you've come of age, but age 10, you know, that's when puberty starts and emotional maturity and all that. So between ages of 10 and 25 is a good window for that coming of age period. And when you apply that, that means that, you know, Radio had its moment, and you got to look at then those tipping points. When did radio have its tipping point? That was back in the 1930s with, you know, the, the FDR, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration. He was the radio president of the Great Depression period. Uh, television had its tipping point in the 50s and 60s. Uh, you know, video games had its tipping point in the, in the late 70s and 80s. So as those tipping points happen, and wh whoever's coming of age during that tipping point, that's how they get named that generation. And doesn't mean, as you've just pointed out, that, that previous generations can't still feed off of, of older technologies, but eventually technology becomes obsolete. I, I hate to break it to people because we talk about the vinyl record and I'm a, I love vinyl. I, you know, I, I used to go around preaching vinyl is final, but I got to tell you, I can't remember the last time I played a vinyl record. I have a vinyl uh, a record player right here in my office. Don't play it. Love, love it but I don't play it because it's not convenient to my life anymore. And that's what happens with technology is it eventually becomes obsolete. And in the book, I have a whole list of obsolete or going obsolete types of technologies. And, and it's not going to be long. For example, the book, uh, as much as I love paper, 
much as I love paper, the book is going away because our youngest generations are being, are being brought up on a pure digital uh, world. Everything's being streamed to them. Everything's being downloaded or uploaded for them. Why would they carry around in their backpack 50 pounds of books when they can carry around on their iPad or their other uh, device, uh, you know, these books in digital format and read them that way? It, it's just, it's changing the world. Yeah, very much so. I, my preferred way of reading, even though I do love the printed word, uh, nothing like a you know, nice book in your hand, you know, turn the pages. I've got a library on my you know, iPad, uh, it's Kindle, and uh, I am literally carrying around hundreds of books, uh, and it weighs you know, one kilo or less. Uh, and I can access any of that. I can take notes, I can share it. Like so I can highlight and send an email to myself and notes and then aggregate that. For me, that's, uh, it's my preferred way of reading now. So, and I can, I can read in the dark as well, which is pretty cool with that. So, um, right. Yeah. Right. There are a lot of advantages to digital. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's good. Well, the digital generations, then they started in 1980 with another twin, uh, technology generation. Remember the generation between 1900 and 1920, they had twin technologies of telephone and transportation. Well, in 1980, to 19 to 2000, that 20 year period, they were what I call the, the PC CP generation, the personal computer mm -hmm. cell phone generation, PC. And if you flip it, it becomes CP, which is interesting. Their first phone was the flip phone. So you just flip it, but they came of age to the personal computer uh, revolution, cell phones becoming part of their lives. In 19, between 1990 and 2010, the next generation is what I call the net generation. They came of age to the internet. And it's interesting, in the year 2000, that's when everything exploded when it comes to, came to the internet and kids were, were really on it. In fact, it wasn't too much long after that, mid 2000s, that you get into the, the social media aspect. And that net generation were the first generation to really feed on that in an active way. And yeah. then from 2000 to 2020, the generation that just is finishing up being born is what I call the iTechs, uh, the iTech, little I, big T. Uh, they came of age to, uh, again, iPods and iTunes and iPads and iWatches and iPhones, the smartphone. And then the, the generation that's, that's being born right now, and I've named them the robo generation, but it's short for robotics generation, born since 2010. They're going to be born all the way to the age to, to 2030. But the robo generation is probably the most unique. And I don't know, this, to me, this is the most fascinating part of the book because you can then project out to 2055, which is their final coming of age years will be in, in 2055, to kind of think about what they might look like, what they might do, the characteristics of this generation. They're still too young. Uh, one of the problems I have with marketers out there that like to name generations after only a couple of years, I mean, the, the guy who named uh, Gen Z, Gen Z, even, I think he named them in 97, and 1995 was the start. These kids were still toddlers when he named them Gen Z. And it got them a lot of money, got them a lot of notoriety, got them a lot of uh, press, a lot of workshops, and probably speaking engagements. But you don't name a generation that's only two years old. You really have to let, a sociologist will tell you, and, and a historian myself will tell you, that it takes about 10 years for us to start to see qualities and characteristics and personality emerge. And this year, 2020, we have seen the age of the robot just start to, to explode. Mm. A year ago, there was an ad for the Super Bowl uh, here in America, and it was, um, some, uh, it was Intuit um, Tax Company. And they were introducing to America Robo Child. And I was, I was at that point, as I was writing that chapter, I was trying to figure out, you know, I kind of had an idea where I wanted to go with it. But when they, when I found that commercial and I remembered it, I went, that's it. 10 years in, almost 10 years in, here you have Robo Child being introduced. I want to introduce to you the Robo Generation. And what has happened in the last year is there's been an explosion of robots in our, in our world. Uh, robots all over as far as not just manufacturing robots, but ro every drone is a robot. Self-driving cars are robots when you think about it. Uh, in many ways, your cell phone is an inanimate 
robot, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's artificially intelligent. And so in that chapter, Jeff, th that's my fascinating chapter because I, I was trying to think, how do I frame this? In, when, when I deal with the iTechs, I, I call them a, a, a 3D uh, type of, of generation. When I look at uh, the millennials or that, that CPPC generation, they were a WWW generation. And each one of those, you know, WW means they were a watch generation. They were a worthy generation. They were a wanted generation. You know, the, the 3D generation of the iTechs, they were more digital. They were more um, decentralized uh, in, in how they looked at things. And, and they were more diverse. That's the third D for them. But when you look at the... Um, this robo generation, they are coming of age to what I call hairy technologies or hair technologies, holograms, artificial intelligence, and robotics. Those three technologies are, are emerging. And it is funny, uh, you know, people don't think holograms, well, we've had holograms for a while, but we're gonna see a new age of artificially uh, manufactured holograms, especially in the entertainment industry. Uh, last November here in Boise, we had Roy Orbison and Buddy Holly in concert down here at, at the Morrison Center. Buddy Holly and Roy Orbison have been dead for a long, long time. Mm. This was a live concert, and it looked people who went to the concert said it looked just like them. It was like they were actually on stage performing. They were holograms. And that's what we're going to see. There's a, a whole bunch of that uh, happening. And it's, it's, it's really going to start to emerge. But artificial intelligence and robotics, uh, they are starting to bubble right now. And basically, if we thought the last uh, uh, you know, 120 years was wild, and I often say that the last 20 years, we've had a lot of, of change. The next 10 years, Jeff, is going to be some of the most incredible transformational change uh, that we've seen in, in our culture. It is, it is literally going to explode. It's going to be a whole new world in 2030 around this, these hair technologies. Mm. Yeah, it's going to have huge implications. And, uh, you know, robotics, <clears throat> the enhancement of the humanity through, you know, externally, uh, also yeah. through mind. Like you said, we're carrying around, you know, the smartphone uh, is really just, it's basically like having a brain in your pocket. It's an, it's an enhanced brain in your pocket. Um, but what, before we leap into more robotics and the other, you know, the, the you know, basically where the future's going in, in terms of your hair technologies. Um, so let's go back a little bit to the start of the digital uh, era or digital phase. Mm -hmm. uh, I ended up working, I left teaching after teaching for about five or six years. So my original career was uh, did a teaching degree and then went and taught high school. And I decided to get into the whole PC tech industry in the mid 80s um, and that transformed me. So I was well beyond uh, my transformative years uh, in that sense, in terms of being in my 20s or even my teens. So I leapt into the PC industry, which was the, you know, the battle between you know, the Apple and Microsoft. And so I found that era absolutely fascinating. It was like the Wild West, you know, so it was the rise of the individual PC as opposed to the mainframe. But then you had, so the PCs were like islands of information. But then what started to happen is they started to get networked. Yeah. Uh, now that's when it started to get more exciting. Then that the network was a network within a building or within an organization. But what got me really excited um, was in 1994-95 when I connected to the internet on using a modem which a lot of people haven't even heard of but the modem allowed us to communicate with the world um, connect to the internet before it was just kept to the elite uh, which was you know the universities and the colleges because the internet it was, was actually, military yeah. military developed at first the ARPANET was a military uh, use yeah. Yeah. yeah and then it got used in the universities it was for the elite and then we had the rise of the um, you know, democratization of that connectivity where the personal computers started to get connected. And I remember for the first time using the browser Netscape <laughs> and uh, using a very slow modem to actually, you know, I think we started at 28, 28 2.8K or whatever it was. five I think I started at 14.4. Yeah, I mean, it was like ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. You know, it had that strange sound, you know, as it as it popped yeah. in, and 
Yeah, it went, and it was so slow. You went off and made a coffee while you waited for a, a web page to download. Um, you go into a search on Netscape, and it's like you had to trawl through a hundred pages to find something meaningful. But I was fascinated by that then. But I think the next phase. So we got the individual PCs being connected. Uh, Information is now being shared. Now it's almost like the brain of the planet is being connected to. You know, everyone's being connected. The next phase that I got excited, I remember watching my kids as they were teenagers, even younger than that. Uh, I remember they would finish dinner and they would rush upstairs to the office so they could actually be the first one to use the PC connected to the internet. Um, using broadband, we had, we, you know, we're fairly advanced in Australia back then. And what, uh, what they did is they leapt onto a little strange site back then called MySpace. Right. Now, I... For me, social media, I think, was one of the... It actually humanised technology. In other mm -hmm. words, the, the isolated PC that was used for spreadsheets and Word, and then you had the corporate PC, and then that was all connected. And then social media showed up, and the first one that really got real traction um, was MySpace. So tell me a little bit about your insights, what you think the implications are for, you know, in this digital phase... Yeah. What are some of the insights you have regarding this event, uh, the social media? Yeah, price? yeah. So, social media. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot that can be said on that one, and 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 in fact, in the book, I I really unpack that a lot because to me, social media is really what, and I love how you put it, humanized us. Because I, if you remember some of the early criticisms of you know the internet in particular was that it was going to have people alone in their basements you know mm -hmm. separated from people we would have no interaction and addicted or whatever it might be and that is not what happened uh, I like to say today we're not connected we're hyper connected I mean, the, the cell phone literally hyper connects us all the time. It's constantly dinging with updates and notifications and news and, and our Facebook and our Twitter feeds and Instagram and Pinterest and YouTube. All those things are constantly, you know, feeding us information. Social media changed us. And, and I, I'll, I'll make an observation on this COVID moment that we're in. I don't like the word social distancing. I think it's a poor word. I think it's poorly yeah. played. We're not social distancing at all, if you really think about it. Physical, we're physically, phys physical physically distancing. distancing. I agree. Totally but agree. we're not socially distancing uh, at all. I, I, we're having a conversation here. You're in Australia and I'm in America. We're, we're having a, a conversation. This is very much a social moment. So we're not socially distancing. We're physically distancing. And, you know, I run some life groups for my church, for example, and we moved to Zoom. And, and I loved you were, I listened to one of your podcasts earlier today, and you, you said it so right that Zoom is now a verb, just like Google uh, is, is a verb. I'm going to Google or I'm going to Zoom. You know, it's become a verb. And Zoom changed everything. I think a lot of us kind of, I, I was already well aware of Zoom. I was using it with my grad classes and stuff. But I got to tell you, I had a hard time getting my grad classes to Zoom with me before COVID. COVID hits, and all of a sudden, um, I start doing Zooms on Friday Zooms with my grad class, which is an all online grad class. And they're, they've been stuck all week long in their apartments or their houses, and they just, they're desperate for some so for some connection. So they said, yeah, let's Zoom. They come in, and then I bring a guest in, someone like you, to come in and talk about the topic of the week. And we record it and we put it up on YouTube and, and stuff. It, it changed my grad class. My entire, how, how the pedagogy of how I was teaching changed because of Zoom. And the problem is, is that a lot of educators today don't think outside the box. They're still trying to think of, you know, we got to still do this like we used to do it in the classroom. What social media teaches us is there's a new way to communicate. And it's, we, we have to kind of figure that out. Uh, Twitter has taught us that uh, we, we can communicate with brevity. YouTube has taught us that we can communicate with visuals. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Instagram and Pinterest as well has taught us how we can communicate using, using visuals. So social media teaches us a lot. Facebook has redefined friendship when you think about it. 
it used to be that if I had a friend, it was someone that I had spent some time with. We had, we had some things in common and you were my friend. Well, on Facebook, someone pops in and I had someone here about five years ago, friend me on Facebook. He just liked some of the stuff that he was kind of catching off my feed. I guess it kind of got out there and he popped in, wanted to be a friend. And we started, we started a friendship online, communicating back and forth. And I was in Washington, DC this last spring. And lo and behold, he lives in the DC area, found out through Facebook, because I said I was kind of going that way, that I was going to be there, says, let's meet. We spent three hours together, and, and really our friendship went to a different level yeah. because of that, that, that point. So social media hasn't really, it's connected us, but I also think it's hyper-connected us. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's, it's redefined friendship, it's, it's redefined relationship, and it's redefined how we communicate. And it's something that, again, businesses, um, schools, churches, um, institutions, other institutions need to pay attention to. Uh, it's, the world is changing. Yeah, that's what excited me about social media when I first stumbled upon it, was noticing people's observation, not observing people's behavior. And I noticed that uh, it was a very obsessive technology, just like TV was, still is. Addictive. Yeah, yeah. it's addictive. Um, then what happened was uh, I said, wow, I can reach the world um, from my own bedroom, office, lounge room. Um, I can connect with tribes, my tribe. In other words, those who have the same interests as me, whether it's vinyl or whether it's marketing or whether it's, you know, Star Wars, you know, collecting, whatever. It doesn't really matter. So it allows you to collect to a global tribe. Whereas, you know, so you might have been in a small town and there's, you're passionate about cheese, right? So, but there might only be one other person or no one in your town that's actually interested in cheese. But if you go on to social media and try to connect with those passionate about cheese, there's going to be a million of them around the world. So, uh, as I say, uh, blessed are the cheesemakers. Um, so, uh, uh, I was going to say, the other, the other problem with social media is that it flattened news. Yep. It, it allowed every person to be a newsmaker, a commentator, a reporter. And when social media did that, that's when this thing, we call it fake news here in America, fake news started to emerge. And it is amazing. I think today in education, the most important thing is not to teach our students what to think, but how to think, how to evaluate information, how to critically analyze and understand, well, hey, listen, that that piece of information is interesting. My wife got a a wonderful uh, meme the other day from somebody and it was, it was political in nature. And the, when she, when she played it, she said, Oh man, this is terrible. This is terrible. And I said, what is it? And she read to me, I said, I don't think that's true. There was something in it that just kind of flagged for me. I said, why don't you do a little bit of a research on that? And she did on her smartphone. She just kind of Googled and did some research on it. She said, within 30 seconds, she said, it's totally false. But it mm-hmm. sounded so true. And because the narrative was something that was in our wheelhouse as far as a narrative that we wanted to believe, it was easy for us to accept it as truth. And that's the problem. You have these narratives flying around with, with fake news and false uh, ideas often pushing them up. And yeah. I'm fast. To me, Jeff, the most fascinating thing about social media are the narratives. I love to listen to narratives and and my, my doctoral professor put it this way. He said, you can never understand a person until you stand under them. This was the process he called the deconstruction. You know, you have to deconstruct a person's life. You have to look past their experiences, their, their politics, their religion, their, their background. You have to kind of pull those away to really understand who they are. And, and see them for, for what they are. And, and I, I find that interesting. And maybe that's what I did in my book, uh, is I just kind of deconstructed America and, and posited a different way of looking at generations. Yeah. Well, I found the book fascinating uh, in terms of how it actually, uh, I suppose, put it in, in neat boxes. And as we know, boxes aren't neat. We just use them to make sense of the noise, don't we? Mm-hmm. It's really about distilling complexity into simplicity. So we put them in stages, whether you you know, defining, you know, baby boomer, Gen X, whatever you want to call it. These are not perfect uh, boxes. They're actually just ways of making sense of a crazy, noisy world that we live in. Right. So social media has risen, which, and I, you use the term flattening, uh, a term I like to use as well. It's called democratization. In other words, 
it, it decentralization. Yeah. yeah, it's so it allows people all to have a voice. Mm -hmm. um, but, but there's some worrying things about this voice now, in the sense that organic social media has certainly been diminished by the algorithms of the of the players, you know, the big players. So, you know, the media moguls that you had to pay to get attention, okay, of the past. Now we have the media moguls of the present and the future. They just happen to be the big four. They happen to be Google. They happen to be mm -hmm. Facebook, um, and they happen to be Amazon. So, and so the reality is, uh, they're the new media moguls, and they can define who talks to who and who what algorithms define you. We're in the middle of the battle of the algorithms as well. So you've got social media rising. You've got then you've got the other obsessive technology the smartphone shows up at the same time. So you've got this perfect storm of two obsessive technologies and they're both, I'd say, you would mostly call them megatech. Is that correct? Where, how do you see that playing out? Yeah, it's actually interesting that, remember the three megatechs were uh, of, the, of what I call the postmodern area, that three megatechs were television, cell phone, and internet. Mm. They're all combined in one device now. That's right. We watch our television on here. Yep. You know, I, we, we, we can, you can, uh, it's obviously a telephone. It's still a communication device, but it's how we connect to the world. Um, my, my mother-in-law lives with us and uh, she's a wonderful person too, but she still lives in 1995. She still has her flip phone. And we've tried for years to get her to just, you know, upgrade to a smartphone. She won't do it. Uh, and it, it, it creates unique in interesting problems for us when when we need to do certain things that she needs but um, th this thing it's a GPS it's a music player it's think about all the technologies that are included mm. in this in this little phone um, yeah. this and it's really not just to call it a phone would be disingenuous it's a device yeah. you know it's a smart device and it's a, and, it, uh, yeah. Some some people actually think that this is this was the start that this device is the start of the of what they call the singularity, you know, where more man and machine mold together. And, and, and one of the reasons they say that is if, if you lose your cell phone, if you lose it, it's like a death. Mm. A lot of us don't know what to do. Uh, you know, you, you, you lose it. You, you misplace it. You just kind of put it, where's my cell phone? And you call it, you can't find it. You know, if you have it on silent, yeah. you're in trouble. Yeah, well, you feel like you've lost part of yourself. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Because you have. A lot of us keep our memories on this. I, I've been working, Mike, you, you may have heard of the Google project to digitize all the books in the world and, and have them uploaded for us to be able to download. That's the Google project. I've been working on the Chromie project. I love all sorts of old television. I collect television uh, um, shows. So I have television shows all the way back to the 1950s. And I collect in particular first season television shows. But I've been slowly digitizing my entire collection. I have been doing it for like 10, 15 years now. Wow. And, and eventually I'm gonna put it up. I'm, I'm in the process right now of putting it up in the cloud. I don't know what I'll ever do with it, but um, maybe someday you'll be able to watch an episode of Bonanza from 1968 and thank me for it. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward, to, look forward to that moment because I'd really <laughs> like Bonanza really. So uh, let me know. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's sort of start to look at what the future maybe looks like. And I think we're starting to see that. I think the pandemic has accelerated change that was already happening. So, I'd love to hear your thoughts in this digital phase um, about what COVID, what this pandemic is doing uh, to us as humans and where you see that playing out. Well, I have been predicting for probably 15 years now that there's going to be what I call a blue screen moment for our culture. Uh, it, it, that blue screen moment was in reference to the, you remember when a computer would have that, it would just, yeah. the old Microsoft, it would just come up with a blue screen. And basically it meant that you're in trouble. The whole thing has to start over. I had a blue screen moment with a computer back in, uh, what was it, 1998, 1999, and I had just finished a book. I literally had my entire book on there and I lost it all. And it, it took, I, I had to, it took me six months to write it, but I had to reconstruct it for a deadline within three weeks. But that blue screen moment caused a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, a lot of doubt, a lot of, you know, where are we going? What am I going to do here? 
But in the process, I actually think I wrote a better book. <laughs> you know, when I rewrote it, I actually wrote it in a better, better. Blue screen moment is what COVID is for us as a culture. It has caused us all to rethink how we do things. When you look at business, it has changed entire business models. Restaurants. We got a restaurant here in Boise that used to, it was it was a cafe. It was a breakfast type of cafe. When the COVID hit and they had to shut down, they couldn't have anybody in their their restaurant, and they weren't really set up to do a takeout. You know, most people don't do takeout for breakfast. It just wasn't a good model. But what they did have was lots of toilet paper, lots of other things that people suddenly wanted and needed. And so they started a new shop. They just, they turned their floor of tables into a, a manufacturing place to, or a, a warehouse and because their distributor was different than the other stores in town. They were able to get stuff that other stores couldn't get. And so they started selling. They totally changed their, their whole model. Hmm. Seeing this right now in America in particular, I don't know how it is there in, in Australia, but in America, we're having a serious conversation about whether or not we're going to have school. Well, I could tell you, you know, in, in 2000, I was predicting already that we need to get ready. I was a college professor and I was telling the school I was at, you know, the best thing we could do would be to, to sell these buildings, sell everything right now and move online and become a totally digital university. Had we done that back then, the, the, we would have been totally prepared. But most schools right now have, have kind of, they made online learning, you know, just kind of one of those things, well, we'll do it if we have to do it. Hmm. But now they have to do it it's because they have to do it. They have to do it. It's totally changed. In, in my world with the, the churches, for example, churches are having a terrible time because they're so used to having people come and congregate in a space. Well, you know, YouTube and Zoom and all that has totally changed. And there are people out there like you and I who get it. And we've been getting it and we've been talking about it, but no one's been listening. And what the COVID moment has done is it's been a wake up call that we can't ignore. This is not an interruption, my friends. I hear that a lot of times. Oh, it's just an interruption. It'll, it'll go away. Last, last March, it'll just go away. It, it, we'll, be, we'll be shut down for a couple of weeks and it'll go away. I think it's a disruption. Hmm. It's a disruption. It's not interruption. And a disruption is what transforms us. It's what moves us out. It changes everything. The Protestant Reformation was a disruption of European culture. And it changed European culture for 500 years. The Protestant Reformation did. There are those types of things that happen. And this, this one just happened to be, who would have thought a little virus would bring the whole world to its knees? Hmm. But it has. It certainly has. And I'd be curious what you think about all this, because uh, uh, you're, you know, I'd like to learn a little from you today as well. It, it, I, yeah, I've reflected a lot on it. I've, um, I've been working essentially in a digital world for the last 10, 12 years. And uh, I, it, for me, um, I, was, I was ready. Um, but essentially, I'm, I'm really fascinated by the accelerated change that I think, like the change was already happening. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it's for me, you know, getting in the car to commute for an hour or get on a train and commute for an hour uh, from a distant suburb into a high rise, uh, for me, that's just an anathema. I, I just going, this is crazy. And um, Sure. So we've got to balance that with the social aspect of being human, which we are humans, are social creatures. Um, so for me, looking into the future, I'm, I suppose, both concerned and also amazed and, and hopeful. Um, I, you know, there's both, any technology has a good side and a bad side. And, and uh, I was in... Um, Egypt Youth Forum about uh, two years ago, and uh, it was put on by the Egyptian president, and uh, he hosted a round table, which I was uh, honoured to be part of. And on one side of the table was the negatives, in other words, the, the, the cons of social media, and the other side was the pros of social media, which, what are the good aspects and what are the bad aspects of social media. And uh, me being an optimist, an eternal optimist, um, I saw, and because me, social media was just a great way to connect with the world, it gave me a voice without the gatekeepers. And I saw it as and a way to get your creation out to the world. And I, what I discovered with social media was 
I can change the world in, its own, in my own small way. But along the way, the feedback I got on this two-way communication from social media was that the world changed me. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what were I think in the middle of to uh, what I'm going with this is that we are being changed by this moment. Yeah. Now, I think we as humans have got some choices to make. Whether we want to make it, uh, do we want to grow from this or shall we just shrink back to, you know, country versus country? Are we going to be less global? Are we going to be more global and welcome? I see some positive changes. I think I see a lot. You walk down a street now, people actually say hi because we're now, we are in this together. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, getting on and doing Zoom calls with friends all around the world, I think I spent three hours on Monday night, you know, Zooming with three or four different groups of friends, individuals, and it was just fantastic. What really worried me a little bit in one sense was I actually was almost enjoying this, you know, virtual drinks as we occasionally do. Um, <laughs> I went, wow, this is actually almost as fun as actually catching up. Um, so we... The accelerated change, I think, the nature of work is going to be totally different. Yeah. Um, the nature of socialising is going to be different. Uh, how we run events, uh, big conferences. The conference industry in the US is huge. Our 30,000 conferences a year, I believe, in the US. That's going to be changed forever. Uh, it's just so many elements to the change. And I think as humans, we've got to try and embrace the positive. Uh, and grow from it. We don't learn from comfort because we all sit back and, you know, go, I'll just leave things the way they were. We grow from discomfort. Yeah. yeah. That's where real growth and personal development happens. Yeah. And I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, when I teach about cultural change, I, I, have, my, um, I have my audience do, just fold your hands like this, Jeff. You know, you'll notice that you'll have uh, you know, one thumb on top of the other and it feels very comfortable. It's, yeah. it's what it feels like. It just, it's, it's, it's good. But now take your hands apart and put the opposite thumb on top. That's what change feels like. And the thing's interesting is when you ask people, what's that? How do you feel? And immediately they say things like, oh, this is wrong, or I don't like this, or I, I, it's just, it's awkward. They all, all negative feelings. But I say, hold it for a while. Don't let go. Just hold it. And the longer you hold it this way, the more comfortable it becomes. That's what's going to happen here with COVID. You know, as we become more comfortable not dining in, it's going to change how we deliver food, how restaurants deliver food. Yep. As we become more interested in how we consume and buy things, Amazon's made a killing. Walmart's made a killing here in America because they shifted their models very quickly to delivery and pickup, you know. And that, that works. Groceries. My, my wife has not stepped inside a grocery store in weeks. She just goes and picks it up at Walmart. It's, she says it's a whole lot easier to order it on my phone and go and pick it up. Mm. You know, I, okay, that, that works. But you think about schooling. You think about our area. We're, we're both trainers. You think about uh, the training industry. But this is where holographic technology, to me, is going to be interesting. Uh, we're, we're very close, and, and we're, we're already kind of knocking on that door a bit, where holographic technology, I think, in 10, 15 years, will allow me to go to any place in the world and, and have, a, have a conversation, give a workshop or whatever, and I won't be there. I'll be in my living room. I'll be in a studio in my office, but I can go anywhere in the world as a hologram. And I will look very, very real. In fact, looking at me from, from, the, from the crowd, you would think, oh, that's really him up there, which is, is going to change some things. We used to say, I'll believe it when I see it, right? I'll mm -hmm. believe it when I see it. In this new world, it's I believe it when I can touch it and make sure it's real. So authenticity. That's why I tell leaders, that's why I tell teachers, pastors as well. If you want to survive in this new COVID world and moment, you've got to be real with people. You've got to be willing to show them that, hey, I'm authentic. And, you know, that means you can't be perfect. People trying to put together the perfect podcast, forget that. Just put together a podcast. Yeah. You know, this, this conversation is not perfect. I've made mistakes. And, 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 and you love the fact because, you know, you don't have to edit it out. I give you permission to. I am not a perfect speaker. I will stumble at times. But at the same time, 
that's what makes it real. That's what makes it authentic. And that's what people really want is real today. I totally agree with you. And that's um, what I love about podcasting, the rise of podcasting. There's only about a million podcasts around the world, whereas there's nearly a billion websites and blo- well, billion blogs. So the podcast for me, actually, people can see you because you can turn a podcast into a visual, put it on YouTube, which we do here as well. As well as that, we actually put it on, you know, across the whole platforms, iTunes, Spotify. Um, for me, it's actually about uh, having real conversations such as we're having today and uh, to meet the most fascinating people such as yourself and just have fireside chats about what really matters to them or what they're passionate about. And I can see you're absolutely passionate about, um, you know, essentially, you know, being a cultural explorer. You know, what's... Uh, I love it. Yep. Yeah. Um, and I can see it, it's, um, it comes through. So I think that's what you see when you add audio, visual, as well as, as well as writing. None of these are all going away. It's just different types of media. And we all have different preferences for media. Some like to read uh, more than they like to watch. Um, my son doesn't like reading very much. He's dyslexic. So guess how he learns? YouTube. So the reality is that we're all very different as human beings. And... Uh, I, I love this medium to actually, we're having a conversation in high definition uh, mm-hmm. and we're about, I'd say about 14,000 kilometres apart. Um, how's that in miles? That's about actually about 8,000 8, miles, actually. A, um, a long way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The fact that you can transfer that to miles impresses me because I, I, I would have no idea. Uh, yeah, well, uh, we, in Australia, we changed to kilometres in the metric system in 1966, um, including uh, went from pounds to actually dollars. So, uh, <laughs> and I, I just happened to be at school and uh, I learnt both. So I, I can flip between miles and kilometres. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's not a special superpower because it's, uh, I'd rather just pull out my phone and work it out really, but it's okay. So the, the future... He talked about holograms, he talked about robots. Um, the book by Kevin Kelly on Out of Control, which was written quite a long time ago, talked about, um, and I'll be interested in your thoughts on this. He wrote about um, the fact that everything goes back to organic. So essentially the planet, um, yeah, where's humans arisen from this planet? Um, Technology is actually disappearing to us as humans. It's actually not visible. And that's what gets rather exciting is that you, it's hard to tell the difference between what is a robot and what's a human or what's been enhanced by yourself. So where do you see us as humans going? Like the phone at the moment is great, but it's external. Okay, so where do you see? You talk about holograms. Yeah. So how do you think uh, robots are going to be integrated to what we are as humans well, I, I don't like to put a lot of cold water on the, the social theorists out there, the, the technocrats that, that see some sort of singularity coming where man and machine meld into one and then there'll be these great big battles and such for humanity and robot, whatever that might be. Um, I, I think there's a big problem and maybe this, this comes a bit from my own uh, philosophy of life, maybe theology of life as well is that there's something distinct about humanity, something that separates us already uh, from machine, and that's our ability to emote. Uh, you know, in the, in the Star Trek episodes, you remember um, Spock and, and later Data, both of them were androids. They were robots. They were, they were very, basically, they were humanoids, but they had one major flaw. They could not emote. And I do think that that's going to be the one thing that's going to keep us separate from the machine. They're going to look very real. Uh, Japan right now is working on humanoids that are so real that they're real to the touch. They even have, uh, they, they, they feel the skin feels real. It feels warm as human skin would be, but it's, it's completely a a machine Mm. and it's artificially intelligent. Uh, There was, when I was researching the robot chapter, I did a lot of um, study on YouTube. In fact, YouTube's been a wonderful resource for my book. But there are there are entire YouTube videos that show um, some of these Japanese uh, 
uh, robots that they can have a conversation, kind of like you and I are having a conversation. Uh, the robot will start by asking you a question and then you respond and they're learning from you. That's what artificial intelligence is. It's the ability to learn something as it's going. And so it's creating a memory bank, but it, literally they have this, this particular robot that's a, an interviewer. She sat down and uh, this robot did and, and had a conversation and was asking very astute questions by the end. Uh, of the of the interview, but the one thing that robot couldn't still do was emote. It couldn't um, it couldn't feel, and I think that's what's going to separate human beings. I also think the ability to be creative. I'm not sure a robot. Uh, there's a there's going to be a limit to its creativity, and that 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 to me is is interesting. Um, it, it's 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 caused me a lot of thought. Uh, okay. But uh, that's that's probably the biggest difference. I, I don't see a singularity ever happening. Uh, I know there are a lot that that propose that, and and some even fear it that there's going to be a singularity of man and machine. But yeah. I, I don't see that. Yeah. Uh, what what's going to happen though, and just look at it from a from a practical point of view, Jeff, is that robots are going to start taking over those jobs that um, human beings probably shouldn't be doing anyway. You think about firefighting, you think about police work, you think about those type of work. You know, in Los Angeles right now, they have police robots going around patrolling parks in some Southern California uh, areas. We already have police robots, but imagine the day when you have a fire, we don't need to send a human being into a fire. We can send a robot into a fire and they can do the work of a human being. And if we lose the robot, we lose the robot. We don't lose a human life. Uh, you think about uh, war in the future, you know, wars will be fought by robots, I believe, not by human beings. Now, human beings may control a bit of the, uh, of the actions and the, the deployment, if you will, of these machines, uh, these drones and the, and the sky perspective, but um, I, I think it's going to change warfare. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of things on the horizon, and the next 10 years, it's going to just bl blossom. I'll give you one last anecdote here. Um, we were in Sweden last year. Uh, my wife and I, she has relatives in Sweden. And we, um, that night, we got in at nighttime. So we went right to bed. And, and the next morning I woke up and I kept hearing this whirring noise outside the, the, uh, the window. And I looked out and it was a robot lawnmower mm -hmm. going around. And his lawn was perfectly manicured. And I found out that our Swedish relative actually sells these things for a living. That's how he makes his, his buck. And so I was fascinated by this, this robot lawnmower. About every you know, three days, it goes back and mows the same spot. It never collects grass because the grass never gets high enough to be collected. It just kind of shaves it off. So the grass always looks the same. It's beautiful. It's wonderful, manicured. Well, I asked my Swedish relative, how long have you had these robots? Because in America, I saw, I saw one of these lawnmower robots at Lowe's, uh, our, our home, home improvement store here locally. I, you know, and, and we were all just kind of standing around looking at this thing. It was in a little green playpen, and it was just kind of going around on artificial grass showing us what it could do. And all of us men were just kind of standing around going, wow, that's interesting. What are we going to? No, nah, I kind of like my exercise, you know, <laughs> we're, we're all kind of poo-pooing the idea. But after spending a, a couple of weeks in Sweden, it was like, no, nah, I like that. I, I, that. I like that. But Sweden has had robot lawnmowers since 1995. Right. For them, it's a part of their culture. Yeah. And Japanese have had robots for, for a couple of decades now. And the smart ones, have, especially in the last 20 years, have, have started to emerge. So America has been somewhat resistant to it. Uh, I think partly because of our Western ideas on robots. Western, Westerners tend to look at robots as being more evil in, in our, in our uh, movies and such. Robots are always trying to destroy the world. Whereas the Eastern idea of a robot is it's more of a companion. It's a friend. Um, I, I find that also interesting. Yeah, the Japanese have certainly uh, developed robots that look after people in... Uh, yeah, caregivers. Homes. Yeah, in other words, they're actually going to have a conversation. So now I want to go back to um, a, a term you mentioned that we as humans are different to machines in that we have emotions. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it's, it's a personal interest of mine is 
I'm, I'm very positive about the future, uh, but in the meantime, some of the implications of what's happening with social media and digital technologies and, you know, people will walk down the street, they will not look at nature, they've got their earphones on, uh, they actually are looking at their phone, uh, they're actually a danger to everyone else walking on the same path. Uh, people have been killed just walking up the street because they've got their head buried in their phone, which is very sad, but that, the reality is... So there's a negative aspect to digital tech, which is your last phase. Uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts on what do you think are the emotional and mental health issues uh, that are rising out of this? Because we're seeing in uh, the Western world the rise of a lot more mental health issues. Anxiety is rife, um, suicide is rising, uh, and it's a personal um, interest of mine based upon what's happened to me and not personally for myself but uh, my partner um, it was uh, so because she passed away from suicide and two years ago hear that. and for me it's a personal interest and for me it's basically how can we use what can we do as society in this digital age to actually make sure that we have both got the technology to actually help people that are struggling um, and they're entrepreneurs because entre being an entrepreneur is a tough gig, um, you know, it's mm -hmm. a lot of pain. Um, what do you see as some of the implications of the digital age on mental health? I'm sure you'd have some interesting insights around that. And um, so I'd be interested in your thoughts. Yeah. And first of all, I'm, I'm sorry to hear of your loss there, my friend. Um, I, um, uh, I don't see it so much as digital, but more as cyber. It's, it's more the, the cyber culture that creates the, the issues. Um, certainly the, um, uh, the narcissism that can rise, I think has, has some, some impact. Social media. I, one of the best things that I do for my mental health, Jeff, is once or twice a year, I just, I go on a fast. I just leave Facebook. I leave social media. I get away from it. And I just, I just, I literally take the icon off my phone, move it to a back part, a back page, and take off notifications of it. So I don't even know it's there's anything happening. Yep. Um, and, and digital back, detox. Yeah, digital, yep. and, and it's it's one of the most beautiful things for me because I don't realize how much the the phone is a part of my life. So I'm constantly looking. At, oh, there we go. Okay, you know another. And I get in these. I, I get in these uh, conversations, if you will, on, on social media, just because I, I'm a curious person by nature. So I like to kind of hear how people think about things. And sometimes, uh, you know, social media is not exactly the most uh, conducive or productive place if you want to have a conversation. Most people, unfortunately, today, at least on Facebook, tend to want to just uh, yell at each other or, yep. or uh, preach, a, preach a narrative, and, and they really don't want to listen. And, and I, I kind of grew up, I'm a, you know, I have my views. Uh, you, know, you have your views. We all have views. But I grew up in, in a world that's much different. And I think one of the things that social media has done for our younger generation is it's really made a very, it's, it's created a very divisive, narcissistic uh, hole. And, you know, if you're, we're, we're all fighting for that space of truth. I, I think the deep down thing that we all want, we, what is the truth here? That's what we're looking for. And social media is such a cesspool of, of narratives mm. and false narratives often that we, it's hard to tell what is true. We see pictures that look, oh, wow, that looks real. That video looks real. And then you find out it's completely concocted. Uh, it's, it's. So it does have a lot of, of, of social implications. It has a lot of, of mental health uh, implications. Mm. And for those who, um, who struggle uh, with self-esteem, uh, with, um, with, with some of their, their own awareness of who they are, it, it, can, it can really start to, to bite in a big way and, and, and hurt. And um, I feel for those people, you know. Yeah. I, I, yeah. yeah I it's, it's, I think part of the challenge we have as human beings is this evolution and actually a revolution has been so quick that we as humans are struggling to adapt to it. Yes. So how do we use social media properly? How do we use our phones properly? How do we use communi global communication properly that is healthy? Um, and, and 
you know what? I actually turn off. I don't have any notifications from my social media on my phone. They are all off. Hmm. Um, and I very rarely go and check my Facebook uh, news you know, feed. Um, there's a great quote I came upon a friend of mine. She shared it with me about a year ago. And I think it's something we've got to be really aware of, especially when we go and check our Facebook feed and Instagram feed, is that we as human beings judge the inside of ourselves by the outside of others. Mm. Mm. And what I mean by that is we look at the polished personas of Instagram and Facebook and we say, aren't they having fabulous lives? But behind that persona, the real person sits. And we as all as humans, uh, you know, struggle. Yeah. You know, some struggle more than others. And uh, behind that pretty face, that smiling face is often a lot of pain. And I think, you know, we've got to be so careful in that we don't dive into the stream and saying everyone's having a fabulous life and I'm having a shit life. I, yeah. I think that's the reality that we've got to understand. And I think for me, I actually control. I, I really do not go into my Facebook stream very often. Um, and I think I've got a fairly you know, solid self-esteem, a good self-esteem. But uh, I just notice my feelings when I watch these perfect personas turn up, you know, polished to perfection. It's not real. And I think that's the thing we're still learning as human beings to actually deal with this digital revolution. And it's going to take us a generation or two to actually work out how we deal with it with correct etiquette, to actually still be beautiful human beings that hug and hold and look after each other rather than shout and scream um, and how dare you have a different opinion to me. I, I think we are still learning as humans to deal with this digital, digital age. Yeah, I, I'm with you, Jeff. I, I'm a positive person on all this. And I think that uh, if people like you and I just keep um, in, a, in a positive way presenting the ideas saying, you know, we, we truly can not just get along, but we can be productive and, and find some solutions because that's what the world needs today is solutions. Uh, we need to find um, we need to find that. I, I think truth is part of that, but also we just need to find uh, integrity in our um, in our journeys. You know what yeah. is what is real. What's 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 integrity? What's that mean? What's truth? Yep. You know, that's an epitaph of a great life, right there. You know, if you can yep. find truth and integrity and respect, you know, validation. Yeah. Yep. And what I want to share here is uh, real stories, and uh, we've we've heard some from you today, and basically your passion and it's great to hear that um i think um, i look forward to the next book which um i'm sure you're most really already thinking of or ideating um yeah, so, yeah. robo generation i'm thinking about writing just on that robo generation maybe a little bit of the itech generation too but i think we need to start understanding this this youngest generation and hopefully we can you know they're being called generation alpha here in america which right. again Please, can we stop naming our, our kids by the alphabet? I mean, it's just, yeah. <laughs> it's getting old. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, it's putting people in boxes is, um, and categories is good for, uh, but we, it's not truth necessarily. It's just a way to make sense of the world. Um, and I, for me, just, um, I suppose about to wind up here, but the, for me, looking at what's happening in the world, uh, I think we've got to work out what will allow us to deal with the ups and downs of life. How are, how are we going to be resilient? How are we going to flourish and thrive? Um, what are the skill sets we need? I think we need to do, be better at listening. We need to work on our resilience. We need to get closer to nature. Um, there's a whole bunch of, I think, skills that need to be worked on. Um, and uh, I look forward to hearing, um, reading your next book and maybe even hearing your next book, or maybe seeing it as a hologram, maybe that would be fascinating as well. <laughs> there you go. There you go. It may not even come out in printed format, this next one. Who knows? Yeah, it might come out in multiple formats. So there yeah. you go. <laughs> well, thank you, Rick, for a wonderful conversation and uh, for sharing your genius with the world, your creation with the world. Um, and uh, we... Uh, so the book for everyone is called Gen Tech, An American Story of Technology Change and Who We Really Are. It's now available um, in printed format and it's also <laughs> available online. 
Thanks, Rick. It's been an absolute pleasure and uh, look forward to catching up in real life and sharing a beer or wine, whatever your preference, yeah. and maybe a glass of water if you don't touch the other stuff. But uh, yeah, so. Well, I'm kind of addicted to that Coca-Cola stuff. So uh, when, yeah. I, when, I, when I go hard, it's usually a Shirley Temple, you know, but. Uh... <laughs> All right. Thank you very Thank much. you very much, Jeff. Thank it's been a it's been a real pleasure, and uh, I, I look forward to following you as well. I've already you know started uh, started that process because you you are an influencer that uh, I, I want to be uh, want to be uh, following too. So thank well, you. Thanks for being on the show.